Good afternoon, everyone, or morning or evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. I know we're all over the place. Um, welcome to today's program, The Voices of the Second Generation, Children of Survivors Writing Their Stories. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance, stories of resistance, excuse me, against injustice and more. Um, thank you so much for joining us today virtually. We hope you will visit the museum in person if you are able to, um, to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibition, Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust from photographer Martin Scholler, which is running through June 18th. You can learn more and find tickets on our website. We also appreciate the vital support of our members so much here at the museum. If you want to get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions, and free admission, you can explore museum membership on our website or email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Um, closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat in addition to all the links I've mentioned. Um, if you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. So today we are honored to be joined by Dr. Irit Felsen, Dr. Talila Koch-Zohar, and Joran Rosenberg. Irit uh, Felsen, PhD, is a clinical psychologist specializing in the effects of trauma and traumatic loss and the intergenerational transmission of both trauma and resiliencies in families of Holocaust survivors. Dr. Felsen is an adjunct professor at Columbia University and at Yeshiva University in New York, co-chair of the Trauma Working Group in the NGO on Mental Health in the United Nations, and chair of the Older Adults Work Group in the Interdivision APA COVID-19 Task Force. She maintains a private practice in English Englewood, New Jersey. Um, Dr. Felsen's research papers and book chapters have been published in peer-reviewed publications. In addition, Dr. Felsen's art has been featured in art exhibitions in Hamburg, London, and in New Jersey, and is also the background of the image for this program, um, so you can see that on our website. Um, Dr. Talila Kosh Zohar is a retired professor and scholar of Hebrew literature at the Kibbutzim College of Education in Tel Aviv. Her PhD dissertation is a study of Israeli literature by second generation Holocaust survivors. She has published articles, short stories, and two books, Ethics of Memory, The Voice of Nemesine, and the Second Generation Holocaust Literature, and Marta's Notebooks, which is currently being translated into English. Joran Rosenberg was born in 1948 in Sweden, where he is a well-known author. In 1970, he left academia to work as a journalist for Swedish television, radio, and print. He is the author of several books, including The Lost Land, A Personal History of Zionism, Messianism, and the State of Israel, and A Brief Stop on the Road from Auschwitz. He was awarded the August Prize in 2012. So thank you all so much for joining us today, and now I'm going to hand things over to Irit. Thank you very much, Sydney. We are very fortunate today to have with us two eminent authors who each uh, contributed very special voices to the literature of the second generation and about the second generation. As I was reading your books, Joran and Talila, I was struck by the fact that you each found a very special way of uh, creating a work that's somewhere in the space between um, autobiography and documentation. So Talila, you wrote Marta's Notebooks, which is the novel we will focus on today, um, after, several good years after your research book, uh, The Voice of uh, Mnemosyne. Uh, in Martha's Notebooks, you actually uh, call it a biography-based novel in which you had the um, very special opportunity to incorporate the authentic uh, diary mm, right. by your mother. And right. so you combined um, certain um, uh, autobiography-based um, material and you call it, and I'm sure we will hear more about it a little bit later, you call it autofiction, which yeah. is a combination of, um, of biographical material the diary and some other stuff that you invented, which I found uh, perhaps a very 
unique way of expressing the um, voice of the second generation in general, which is somewhere between what we <clears throat> know and what we imagine. Mm. And Joran, you uh, wrote the um, novel "A Brief uh, Stopover on the uh, from on the way from Auschwitz," which is a meticulously documented uh, recreation of the torturous journey of your father across Europe until his death by suicide in 1960, and you refer there to the process of collecting fragments fragments both of the the journey of the father that you refer to as the man Haish in Hebrew because I read your book in the Hebrew translation and fragments of the uh, micro interactions and sensory experiences of the boy that you refer to as the boy or the child uh, who is you and you recreate the journey and you recreate the emergence of the sense of self of that boy, um, as you describe um, in the book with many, many uh, details that anchor a lot of it in historical documentation, um, journal uh, and, and newspaper um, uh, pieces and so forth. So um, I will start by um, hearing perhaps uh, from you, Joran, about 20 minutes with you, and then we'll have about 20 minutes with Talila, and uh, and then we will uh, hopefully have some 10 minutes for questions and uh, responses from the audience. So, Joran, would you perhaps tell us a little bit about the novel and uh, what was the impetus for writing this book and why only in 2012? Well, uh, I start from the last, the last question. Uh, I had the idea that I should write a book about my father. And that was an early, early on in my life before I even knew I could write a book. Even I was a journalist and uh, there was nothing, nothing that uh, really made me prepared for um, doing it. But I knew that if I would ever write a book, I would have to do that. And that was for a very simple reason. I was not into researching the Holocaust or anything. I wanted to get to know my father. Okay, you preempted the end. You told, you tell the audience how the book ends. The reader doesn't know that. The decent reader shouldn't know how it will end. I wanted to go there side by side with this man whom I had for 11 years in my life. And, and, and then he disappeared. And I realized that uh, uh, I would somehow need to find a method to bring him back to me. This is my very simple task. And get to know him and try to understand what happened and why it happened. And from this, after a lifetime of work in journalism, several books before that, I realized that this uh, that that I have to get started and doing this. So you call it a novel. <clears throat> well, a uh, novel is often associated with fiction. Uh, I have been very meticulous uh, about this. This is not a work of fiction. It has elements <laughs> that uh, some reader would would see as fictitious in the sense that I search for memory. I'm a child searching for fragments of memories. Uh, a lot, a large part of the book is, is consists of my own, uh, my attempt actually to recreate my own memories of my father and the childhood that went with that. So, if I would title the book something, it's a childhood memoir. It's a memoir of my father and me. But of course, to recreate him, and to try to understand what went on in my childhood. I, of course, had to, to go to follow him on his, his full journey, uh, which is, it was an amazing exploration. I didn't know, I have to say, I didn't know till very late how he got out of Auschwitz. I didn't know what happened because they, he and my mother have to say, my mother was a survivor 
they went on the same transport from, from the ghetto to Auschwitz in the same wagon, young people. And uh, as you probably know, very few of them wanted to tell about it. I wasn't unaware, of course I knew that they came from the war and the camps and, and we have Jewish friends. And there was a group in Sweden of survivors that basically uh, helped, kept together or worked together in my little town where I grew up. But uh, to the very end, I was surprised to find out the details of this whole thing. And then I made this promise to myself as a writer and perhaps to the reader that there will be non -fic no fiction in this book because the story is so unbelievable in itself. It's a miracle. Every road from Auschwitz is a miracle. No one should have, there was not the idea that anyone would leave Auschwitz. So that made me particularly anxious that this book should not be perceived as a novel. And I, as you might recall, I continuously discuss the, 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 whether this is truth or not truth. I, I, I try to somehow reason with myself, is this, is, is, is this, is this, is this happen or did it not happen? And, and, and I have to say, I was lucky. This book was a stroke of luck in many ways. I met people who helped me who I didn't know existed. There was a, there was a, a man who lived in Pol who lived in Germany, who was a non-Jewish Pole, who for many, many reasons, um, actually it was a Volksdeutsche in, so he was even more German, but but it, his father uh, was killed and uh, by the Nazis, and uh, he uh, later later on in life came to West Germany and decided to explore a particular town in Germany, which was Braunschweig and the industrial history of Braunschweig. And when he started to research the industrial history of Braunschweig, he came upon the factory to which my father and a group of young men from, the, from Auschwitz had been delivered in the fall of 1944. It was a factory for, 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 for car, car making, car making, busing, the busing factory. And he made all the research of what happened, who were the people who came there, how did they get there, by what train transports, and so, it it uh, it so so the journey uh, from the road from Auschwitz became so much more detailed, so much more living than I could have mastered myself. My father was dead; I had no one to talk to. The amazing thing is, of course, that after the book was published, many people contacted me and said we were in the same transport or children of the people came to tell them, you're telling the story of my father or my mother. And that, that is continuously happening with this book, still 10 years after its publication, that it touches people, other people's stories. And uh, if I can give my book any sort of general value, it has, I assume, a, a general value in that it gets an insight in in the, in the, I still maintain, I still want to call it that the miraculous salvation of people from Auschwitz or from the Holocaust. I, I say somewhere that, that the, the road to Auschwitz was the same for everyone. It was, it was, uh, was a, it's a road to hell. But the road from Auschwitz, each and every road from Auschwitz was a miracle. So this book, uh, Again, I realized, uh, first of all, I think it gives that sense to the reader, how, how miraculous it was, and of, of course, also how, how difficult survival was, nevertheless. But it also has spread to people in that particular 
circle of people who, who, who survived that little way, that way, it has given them back uh, to some extent the story. And many of them have wanted to write it themselves and asked me for material. But I think if I would say something about the second generation people, I never saw myself as second generation until the term was invented. I didn't know what it was. But okay, I am a second generation. But I'm I a bit somehow try to push away too much responsibility for myself. Yes, we have a responsibility to to the to our people to tell the story that we know. That that is, and it is a very special story. Yes, and it is, and I understand that it has great significance that these stories are preserved and told us as well as we can, but I think that it ends there. I know that there is a other opinions that second generation has a larger responsibility to the memory of the Holocaust. I don't, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I have a, I had a responsibility and I knew it very early on. There is a story I need to tell here, but it's my story. It's a story of my father, it's a story of my mother. And by telling these stories, you get a sense of the whole thing. I think there is no way of coming closer to the, to the actual event that was the Holocaust with all it entailed than to get to know the people of it. Uh, unfortunately, some six millions, we don't, we will never know or more. But I think the stories of the survivors, as when they start telling them, are are of is is a very very let's say effective or efficient way of keeping the memory of the Holocaust a living memory, not a historical memory, but a living, but a living memory. Because suddenly you are there with people of with living people. And if I'm a good writer, which I think I am, at least in this case, you will make these people touch other people. And Sweden wasn't in the war. Most people didn't have the experience of not the war and not the Holocaust, certainly. Uh, after the war, we, there was a, a pretty large number of, of, of refugees coming or survivors. But they didn't have a relation. That was not their thing. The Holocaust and the war was somewhere else. And the Swedes somehow told themselves that we had escaped the war because we were, I don't know, smarter than others or more skillful in avoiding or whatever. But it didn't touch them, I think, the same way as it would touch people who had had their own experience of the war. But this book, I think, maybe I'm thinking too much, but I think it touched so many people in Sweden. Uh, it, saw, it has sold, uh, it's unheard of for such a book, 230,000 in Sweden only. And that I know because, and I know why, because it, it made the Holocaust somehow a matter for them. Uh, I, it's weaved, I, in the story, as you know, Irid, there's also a story of Sweden in the 50s, during this time when he comes there, when he tries to make a life for himself in this new welfare society. And, and uh, I think there is a recognition, people reading this, especially, uh, especially from my generation, they recognize not only their country, but suddenly they recognize the human dimension of the Holocaust. Uh, I, I, I dare say that, I don't know, but I cannot explain otherwise the enormous success of the book, which is uh, for such a book, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, that's... Uh, I don't hear you. Uh, no. It's sorry. It's it's curious that you say 
you you think that you know with response with regards to the responsibility that it ends there i mean you actually have created or or went as far as one can with the responsibility so to speak of telling the story and not only did you tell the story but like you said you put an inordinate uh, level of effort into researching and anchoring it historically. How long did it take you the this this process, Joran? Yeah. Yeah, as I said, that the first I remember exactly when I said it first time. It was early eighties, and I was uh, thirty five, and I was lying on a beach together with a good friend, a, a writer, a good writer, a Swedish writer, and. And we were chat and I said, and I said to him, you know, if I ever write a book, I have to write a book with my, my father. So there it started. So that's that's many, many years. Uh, and and the, the, the topic never left me. And I I, I I approached it from 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 various angles and aspects. But but uh, the writing itself, the the the, the heavy research, um, eight years I would say eight years it took me but, you know I did other things as I say I'm I'm a journalist I mean I'm not a, a full-time book writer but uh, yeah and it also it was also difficult to find the form that took the longest I think how do you write such a book how do you write a book that really has the purpose of uh, bringing back my father to life shall i be in it how shall i be in it? Shall, shall... And, and so this, this process of, of of creating this very specific form which is as you know it's it's a child basically talking to his father more or less at least for some time uh was hard to find and how to combine that with as you say a a historical a narrative of, of, of facts and also i didn't want it i i, I have a sub, certain problem with two emotional books because they make you actually uh, distance yourself for, from the subject so there is you have read it there is a certain and it's it's with i i enter a certain distance it's a distance language because I think it has the opposite effect. It's it's somehow I, I I come to this topic as a I wouldn't say non-engaged. I'm terribly engaged, but I don't want to give that impression. I want to be, give the impression of the child who and the researcher these two roles who meticulously uh, digs out this man from the dead meticulous yeah i think that that is uh that is very very unique and very special about the voice that that you have in that book that meticulous and careful researcher and that curious positioning of yourself between the i narrative and the narrative of the child and the man whom, whom you refer to in this way, right? Mm. The child, I don't know if in English it was the child or the boy, but in Hebrew it was Hayeled, the boy. Yeah. And yeah. the man, Haish, the man. Yeah, and, and, and if you if you notice, yeah, well, he's my dad too. So it's not, it's not or it's but there is one point in the book where I turn, where I switch from the child to I. And I don't know if you recall it. And then when I realize that I have to take a responsibility for things that I see and say, and that's maybe I'm seven, eight, and I suddenly realize I cannot say the child anymore. It's me. Exactly. And I yeah. think that is such a uh, nuanced and such a, uh, a unique way in which it actually manifests the whole complexity of what it means for second generation to reconstruct the actual story of our parents and to reconstruct the emergence of the sense of self of a child of parents who have been through such a thing. 
It's a very, very uh, interesting, I, I thought it was very interesting when I just started reading the book and it was the boy and the man and this child yeah. trying to collect all of those fragments that make us who we are. And the, the, the work that you did, I think is daunting, impossible for many of us, impossible uh, to, to um, immerse ourselves in that level of, of detailed research and in, into our own parents' lives, not in other fields, but into our mm. own parents' lives. I, I, yeah, I don't want to, to, to discourage potential reader. It's, it's not a, a boring or a rather, it's, it, the, the research is, is, I would say I carry it lightly, but it's there, it, it has to be there. Oh, but, I think to... it's fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating yeah. and mesmerizing yeah. and, and shocking in many ways. It captures yeah. one's attention. It is no, yeah. in no way uh, boring. How yeah. did it impact you doing this? Uh, how would you say it, it, changed your perspective on the man that was your father and yourself, the child? Oh, that's a very difficult question. It, it changed a lot. It changed a lot. It, 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 first of all, it was, uh, I knew that I have done what I, I knew that I've done what I had set out to do. And that was a, a fantastic feeling that, that I have done it. And, Somehow, what is this, my destiny? I don't know. You can write, you should write, and this is a story you have to write. And that I managed to do it. It, it was, he, I had a very good memory of him already before, because the time we had together was a good time. I had a good childhood, and he was a wonderful father and a wonderful mother. So it's, it wasn't an, not in any way an, an unhappy childhood. And, but there was this big black uh, emptiness that I didn't know. And all the things I remember of him that I couldn't explain why he did it. Also, so uh, of course, having written the book, he's my father. Now I know him much better. And, uh, and you could have feared that maybe I would find something that would take away something of my childhood memories, no. No, rather rather the opposite, rather the opposite. It's, and, and I, I have to be, I try to be objective when I say, it, say that, but I think that he lived up to the memories I had of him very much so. But also the tragedy became so much more. Of course, of course. Under, yeah, it, 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 the tragedy I knew because I lost him, but I understood him. Yeah. Suddenly I understood him in a way I couldn't, couldn't before. Wow. I understand. I said some in an interview that, you know, if had I been in that position, having been through everything that he had been through, having the fragile psyche that he had was not strong in that sense. I probably would have done the same. Thank you, yeah. Johan. Thank you very, very much. Ah, uh, with that, I will uh, turn to you, Talila, and ask you, could you introduce us to your uh, book, the one that is not yet available in English, but will hopefully soon be, Martha's, Martha's Notebooks? Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about that and uh, whether you call it a novel or I think you call it autofiction um well i wanted to write a novel and i call it a novel and autofiction can be a novel um and i for me writing the the this uh, this book is a sort of reparation double reparation this is my starting point uh i wanted uh, to um give voice to the memoir that my, my mother wrote. My mother wrote a memoir in the 80s. Uh, and um, she writes, she had this talent of writing. She wanted to be a, a writer when she was young. She had big dreams, but she couldn't realize them, of course. And I, 
felt for many years that I wanted to do something with her memoirs. And um, it took me many, a long time, uh, many years to, to see how, what am I going to do? And I, so it is a novel. I wanted to write a literary, a literary a, 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 a text, but it is based on reality. Of course, there are lots of uh, uh, fiction in it, but the facts, the main facts are reality. And uh, it is a novel about writing and the, the, the healing power of writing. And uh, the writing is told in the, in the book is narrated through three perspectives. First, the, the writing itself. So the heroine, Marta, um, arrives to the hospital. She's uh, uh, hospitalized in a psychiatric ward, suffering from deep depression. Uh, erupted uh, because she accidentally she met a woman whom she recognized as a couple she met in in a in a in a Auschwitz. Um, I will not say what is fiction and what is a what is a reality, but uh, it's it's a it's a mix. Uh, and um, she arrived to the hospital, and the, the the therapy is going very slowly. She cannot talk. She's uh, terribly depressed. She she's silent. And her therapist, Dr. Neumann, is uh, a very um, attentive and, and, and very a, a, a gentle a doctor. And slowly he encourages her to write. At the beginning, she's, uh, it's hard, and, but with time she is totally into the writing. So she stays in the hospital for one year and in this year, the memories comes and she starts writing her life, her, the story of her life, since she was born until liberation from, uh, from Auschwitz. And um, the, the therapy and the writing is, is woven together. Recovery is, uh, is, uh, is promoting uh, writing and writing is promoting recovery. And by the end of uh, the year, the... Um, Memoir is completed and she, is, she, she leaves the, the hospital. This is the first part. So the first part tells the process of writing. Uh, the middle of the book, uh, uh, we can find her writing, her notebooks. Before she leaves the hospital, she gives Dr. Neumann her notebooks to read. And as he read them, the, the reader reads them uh, along with, the, with him because it's in the middle of the book. So this is the second perspective, the writing itself, the memoir itself. And the third part is a very short, I would say, confession of her daughter, Naomi, that uh, 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 Marta, later on, she gives the, the notebooks to, 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 to her daughter, Naomi, which is second generation. And the, the reaction of Naomi to these uh, 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 burning potatoes in her hand, she's, uh, she cannot read it and she forgets it here and there. And by the end she reads it, and, but she cannot say anything about it. So um, by the end of, at the end of her conference is, uh, after her mother died, she, uh, this is when she understands that uh, what her mother wrote is her story as well. And she is, like you said, Jorgen, in a way she is now taking responsibility about the story and, and she wants to go on with it and do something with it. And actually the last sentence in the, in the book is the first sentence in the book. So one can understand that there is a circle that the one that wrote the book is the, is the one, is the, is the daughter is now. So this is the three perspective of the, of the uh, talking about writing. It is very biographic, biographical, and there are lots of uh, biographical elements in the book. And uh, the uh, middle of the book, the memoir itself is documentary. This is the these are the memories that my mother, Marta as well, actually wrote. My mother is also Marta. She is also a Holocaust, of, she was a Holocaust survivor. She was hospitalized for a very short time. Uh, she had a very good doctor, and there was a very strong uh, 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 relationship, very close relationship between them, as in the in the in the um, in the novel. And she wrote her memoir. So, in, indeed, this book is a is a hybrid. It's it's a, it's a combination of uh, uh, documentary text, 
And uh, I would call it auto-fiction because it's not totally fiction and it's not totally autobiographical. It's, it's, a, it's a mix. Um, and that's the, the presentation of the, of the, of the book. And I, I would like also to, uh, to, to add uh, a bit to this, uh, maybe I'll answer a question that you, you asked the Jorgen, why did I write this book? Um, it's not because I wanted to know my mother. Uh, it's because I really, as a, as a second generation in our family, nobody talked. My father is also a Holocaust survivor. I didn't know anything about the history of my family abroad. My parents came from Czechoslovakia. I didn't know what happened to them. It took me years to understand that my parents and to know that my parents were Holocaust survivors. I didn't know that. I was over 20 when I knew that my mother, by talking to someone else, that my mother was uh, uh, a, in Auschwitz and she, she survived Auschwitz. Um, and even when my mother wrote her story and she gave me and my brother a bridge to the past, I couldn't speak about it. And she couldn't speak about it either. So we never spoke about her memoir. So I had this, Diff emotional difficulties to, to approach the past. And at the same time, I didn't want it to be a uh, ground, to be silent. So I knew that one day I will do something with her memories. And it is not only because it is my mother, it is because she had this talent of writing. She, her writing is beautiful. She is very precise, very delicate, very, sometimes very funny uh, when she tells about the deportation to Auschwitz and all this time, months in the labor camp, she writes with, with restraint. She's not uh, overloaded with the uh, emotion. Really, she, she has talent. And I think that in uh, a literary point of view, it was important for me that her voice would be heard that she could in a way uh, realize this dream of her being a, a writer. Uh, so this is one uh, one reparation that I wanted to do, really give place, space, voice to her writing, because when she was alive, I couldn't do it. And as for myself, it was a reparation of my distance from my uh, identity as a second generation, my daughter. Uh, I'm really a late bloomer in this sense. It took me years to really understand that it was me and uh, uh, this is now more and more this is how I see myself in the world as a second generation but really took me many many years um, and I um, the, the action the, the, the writing of this book uh, in a literary perspective it was important for me that it would be a literature and not a, not a, 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 a research or a, a something like you did, Jorgen, uh, I, I feel that I, I, I prepared something for myself as well, as for her and for myself. You know, both of you actually touched upon in the book, the issue of the distance from the parent, that this, even while your father was still alive, yes, Joran, you were, you wrote about how you distanced yourself, perhaps too early, perhaps too quickly <clears throat> from the world of your father. And uh, you, Talila, speak about it. I think that as a, as a second generation myself and as a psychologist who's very much uh, dealing with uh, our peers, I think that it's a general phenomenon that to some extent we all distanced ourselves from it. We all immersed ourselves in our own world, in our new world, in our new identity. And only now as we reach our own 60s, 70s, uh, we are um, re-approaching that aspect of who we are. Mm. You know, um, the... The one thing that I want to go back to is the, the depression that you mentioned. And of course, the depression that you mentioned, uh, Joran, you know, your, in your book, in Marta's notebooks, there was this very supportive, incredibly attuned and, and very, very good therapist who played mm. such a major role. And uh, 
actually in your book, Joran, you give some terrible, uh, very appropriate representation of the, um, the way that the mental health professions have uh, betrayed survivors after the war, which is something that I also wrote about. It's, uh, and I think in speaking of the collapse or the success of people, it's not only their own psyche, but what kind of an environment they met, what kind of support and help there was there to help them get over it. Um, yeah. You know, and this uh, was and this was uh, this was in my mother's case. Really, I think it was quite exceptional. I don't think that it was it was uh, something that uh, many many other survivors didn't have this uh, support from this uh, uh, this kind of support. No, this was something not. exceptional. Certainly, and this not. is why and this is why that uh, in reality and in the book. There was a, such a strong bonding between them. It's, it really, it's sort of love that was not uh, not consumed, of course, but uh, there was love between them. And there, many times there is love in this relationship of, of uh, therapy, of course, but this was a, a supportive love. And uh, I think that he helped her a lot. And nevertheless, uh, a few years later, uh, you know, it was so... The pain and the sorrow was so strong and so deep that uh, she couldn't get over it. But uh, she had a few good years. Yeah, right. And I wanted also to say about my late blooming <laughs> regarding the the uh, the uh, the uh, identity of a Holocaust of a second generation a, a daughter that I started approaching this uh, this uh, word uh, via my academic writing. I wrote a. a my dissertation about the uh, writing, the literature of the uh, uh, second generation uh, uh, Israeli uh, uh, writers. And I wrote articles and by approaching other people's books and, and, and writings, I could at last, at least, at last uh, start writing myself. And uh, this was actually my first uh, novel. Till then I wrote uh, only academic papers and uh, academic work. And Martha's Notebook is my first uh, literary novel. And uh, since then, I'm going on. I'm con I continue writing. So it's great <laughs> for myself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dalila. So I think that uh, we have quite a few uh, comments and questions in the chat, which I ask Sydney <coughs> to collect for us. Mm -hmm. There is so much more that, uh, that we could talk about hopefully we'll touch upon some of these things with the comments and questions please Sydney could you share some of them with us yeah so um I just want to say thank you to all the other 2Gs who are tuning in we've gotten a lot of comments um about people relating their own experiences but I'm going to try to keep this more to questions for our panelists so thank you for sharing those um so I'm going to combine a few and we have some people who are asking about if you have any advice for other 2G writers who may want to write about their own parents' stories, mm -hmm. if either of you have any advice on how to go about that. Whoever wants to start. Think, uh, oh, well, I, I, I don't see myself. Them. Sorry? I guess both of you could answer <laughs> no, that if I, you want. No, I, 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 uh, I don't feel that I can give advices at all. It's so personal. It's it is personal, and at the same time, of course, as you said, Irit, it's also shared by by bigger group of uh, second generation. But I think that each writing uh, in this subject is so uh, is so uh, subjective and so personal. I don't have any uh, any advices to give. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Maybe Jorgen has. Jorgen. No, uh, no. I, I you answered well. I I don't think there is a general advice to give. Uh, there is the writing itself, uh, which is, yeah. which I think shouldn't shouldn't be overwhelming, but it shouldn't be as underestimated. But then I would say there, not everyone has to write the big book for the world about, about but writing down, trying to find out your own family history is good enough. Uh, I know my children uh, did they, of course, they knew even less. 
but they have suddenly to them i opened a new world a new a new history which has affected them much more than i could could have imagined uh, and it's 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 a big difference before between their life before the book came out and their perception of things my mm. my eldest daughter actually um, pursued and did a series of films about my mother uh, she went to poland uh, she and it, she's a quite famous actress in sweden so so it was broadcast on the television so it, but but a particular advice for people as as a, as a, as, a, as a swedish writer used to say dig where you stand and see what you get and and <laughs> and uh, and uh, if you if you have the, the tenacity and a little bit of the talent it might turn out to be a, a wonderful thing to do and, and it yeah, will and solve I, itself I, eventually you want to add i want to you? add yeah i want to add uh, uh, something that was uh, said once by a a, a a a writer not regarding the, the the second generation writing but writing at all he said you have you 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 have to you write only what you have to write you yeah. must have in you inside you what you said you you must have this desire to write so i think it goes with the second generation as well not all of them are uh, in this uh, need to write but many maybe yes so this this is something that should come from inside this desire to write this uh, uh, necessity to write And I can add uh, to support what you said, Johan, you know, I think even if we don't have much of a talent for writing, I think that uh, having taken many, many of the testimonies of Holocaust survivors and having spoken with so many second generation, sometimes second generation who asked me to watch the testimony of their parents first before they could watch it themselves, I can mm. tell you that It doesn't have to be a piece of literature, but I totally agree with you, Yoran, that it's very important to somehow make it accessible in whichever form to our children. It's an incredibly important uh, aspect of their identity. And you know, we, the second generation, for better and for worse, or for worse, we had The, uh, the one thing that we knew very well, we didn't know exactly what happened to our parents, but we knew our parents. And we had those fragments, Joran, that you were trying to put together, the micro interactions with them, the look on their face, the, the turning of the head, uh, those little things, we had that. Our children don't have that. And what I can tell you from my connection Uh, as a researcher as a, and as a clinician with the third generation is that for those of them who uh, don't have, they actually have a troubling void. They don't know things. They don't know why certain things are a certain way for them. They, they lack the story. They lack the connection. And they still have a lot of those shadowy um, transmitted Um, whatever you want to call them, that are there, but they don't know what to connect it to. They don't have those micro interactions. They don't have those fragments that we did have. And mm -hmm. so it is much better that we provide what we can for them to be able to make their connections. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I think so. That's, that's good, good, very good, well-spoken, I would say. Thank you, thank you. Any uh, other questions that were there? Yeah, we had one that came in that asked, um, how did you both deal with the feelings that kind of came up as you were writing? And um, do you feel that writing, you know, helped, was, was a, a way for you to kind of, think through these feelings I, i can start this time yeah it's it's a it's an arduous process mm -hmm. i was uh, I, i could write when i was overwhelmed by my feelings which happened uh, sometimes i was devastated by what i was doing and then i couldn't write mm -hmm. i could only write when i had mastered these things and and cooled down and and assumed the writer's position which is the only position 
you can have if you want to do this, uh, at, at least in my case. But it is it's it it is a process that if if you start doing it, it will it will change you, but affect you. And I had some tough moments when I wrote this book, and I can still I have to admit I can still cry when I read it, my own book. Did your mother live to read it, Joran? Yes, thank God. Yes, she did. Wow, I'm so happy. Wow. And so no, she she lived in 2015. Yeah, that was so important to me that she mm. she was able to to read the book, and uh, and it meant it meant uh, it meant some years extra, I think, for her. I her life. I am sure, I'm sure. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Mm. Um, I felt quite the same. I mean, I was very emotionally involved in the in the in the writing, and uh, I was I loved my mother, and my mother loved me. I was I had a, had a good childhood too, and I was loved. And it was difficult for me to read the memories and to to write a story. And I could really really write only when I um, considered Marta in the book as a literary uh, uh, character. Uh, <laughs> At the beginning, it was my mother. I was writing about my mother, and it was very, very uh, disturbing, very painful. And it took me quite a while to write about a figure, a literary figure. Her name was Marta, and she was in the hospital, and she was writing. And once I could do this, do this separation between me and my mother and write about Marta, which was not my mother, I could continue. So it took me quite a while, and I had moments where I was... Uh, not crying, but um, I had um, I had uh, pains and sorrow that uh, uh, submerged me, and 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 I, and I I stopped and I restarted. But once there was this, like you said, I was the writer and I was writing about literary figures, and I disconnected it from myself and from my own mother and from her tragic destiny. It went on. And once the, the book was finished, I, I don't know, I felt uh, this, a, 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 um, uh, it was mixed, mixed feeling. It was, of course, I was very satisfied. I was very happy and very, uh, and very uh, um, uh, satisfied with what was, came, came out, especially when I started having uh, reactions from readers, which was very, very uh, supportive, and very, very... Uh, um people really identified with the book with the with the story and it was very uh, uh, um, uh, fortifying to hear it and at the same time I was very sad I don't know why <laughs> it was it was mixed feeling um but still it gave me strength and and and, and desire to go on writing and this is good well um I would like to say, you know, I, from the very beginning, as a very young psychologist, I still had the opportunity to work um, under the tutelage of Hillel Klein, who was a psychiatrist and a, mm. and a survivor himself. And he was one of the first <coughs> to point out that the mourning of the survivors is not a pathological thing, but it's a way of staying connected with the people that they love. And so, you know, I think it's hard to separate from the book or the process or the, or Marta. And mm. uh, like you said, Joran, somewhere in the book that separations are, it's difficult to tell the difference between different separations in, in life because of the, the tragedy of the separations in our parents. I, I said that about, the, about, my parents yes because they had separated so many times and forever and 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 so i use it today in a particular moment where where i, I yeah they couldn't distinguish one separation from another it was that's exactly right yeah. and i think that is something that is so true for so many of our families that we they could not distinguish between different separations and the emotional response to separation was so uh, in a way disproportionate or amplified 
and to many of us second generation, some of echoes of that have, have been transmitted. Okay. And, um, and it just came up for me when you said it was hard for you or sad at the end of the writing, perhaps as another form of separation. Yeah, sure. Could be. Mm. We only have two more minutes, I believe. Yeah. Uh, other. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give you all a chance if you wanted to say anything, you know, any final remarks or anything like that before we end. I can only say that uh, it was great to to be on this thing. I I, I sometimes try to get over the second generation thing. I, I sometimes tell myself I've done it. I wrote it. I, you know, whatever. But I realize, and I guess this program testifies to that, that this is this is an ongoing process. I I only wish that we do it well. I only wish that we that we try to 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 be good custodians of our stories. That that as much as we can do. But but that's that's what I would say. Yeah. 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 Me too. I would like to thank you, Irit. First of all, reading my book and uh, finding it. Uh, uh, interesting enough to be uh, translated to English and to be here and to speak about it. Uh, yeah, I'm very grateful for you and for Cindy and for Jorgen and for all this uh, session. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both very much for agreeing to do this with me. Your books are exceptional. I cannot uh, recommend it enough um, for anyone. Um, to read, and uh, I hope that uh, that this was uh, a meaningful and inspiring session for mm -hmm. many of us. Thank you, Joram, very, very much, and thank, thank you. you, Talila, and thank you, Sydney, for facilitating all of this. Yeah, I want to thank all three of you as well um, for for doing this and for joining us today.